You guys getting it out there? Okay, there we go. So this is why, yeah, we need another half hour. But also, this is why I love conversation piece so much. And I love that we get to document this and send it out to the internet. But to be in this room is, is really magic. Every single event we've had so far, we've had 100% engagement in this networking, creative collaboration uh, portion of our programming. So these discussions are so important. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here to participate in these discussions. And what phenomenal input we've had just discussing what is work? What's the nature of work? What does the culture say about it? What do my parents say about it? What does my heart say about it? And what's my passion? What do I enjoy? And where do those two streams meet to create the most nourishing water? We're going to talk more about that in our discussion with our guest speaker tonight. Now, Christina Lakey is one of my favorite people to follow on social media. The, the diversity of her activities and the intensity of her activities are just downright inspiring. And when I, when I see the events that she puts on, when I see the way that she expresses herself, when I see the way that she voices her brand, I think, man, like that just looks like a lot of fun. But I know she's working. I want to do that too. So that's one of the reasons that I invited her here tonight. She is Flint, but she is also a businesswoman, and she is also a creative. She's a human being that I truly believe you can see yourself in. She has done a plethora of really cool things in the Flint area and beyond. She's done the Goblin King players putting on shadow cast performances. Just, just got through a run of the Princess Bride that was fantastic. She has done the Fisher Body. She does the Flint Zombie Walk. The epitome of dreaming up the world you want to live in and then dreaming out loud is this woman. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Christina Lakey. Thank you. Thank you so gall darn much for being here. Thanks for having me. So I'm, I'm curious about your discussion. You and I have talked about the, the work, enjoyment, and passion dynamic just in our, our meetings leading up to this event. What was the discussion at your table like? Uh, pretty unanimous, um, how we see work. And we all seem to think it's something you should enjoy to some extent. And sometimes that you just get through, but always something you learn from. So tell me about your work. Well, for my money work, I'm a sign language interpreter, um, and I'm a mother, which is my most important work. I'm a wife, which is pretty much up there with everything else, because relationships are work. I run the Flint Zombie Walk. That's a lot of work. Um, I'm an actor. I do cosplay. Yeah, that's, that's my work. So when does it... When does it feel like work? So the traditional definition of work, if we're going to assume that it's arduous, it's someplace we don't want to be, but it's things that have to get done, when does what you currently do start to feel like work? Well, I won't talk about my interpreting work because that's, it is creative, but um, it's harder to relate to, I think, for a lot of people. Um, I'm going to talk about the art specifically and how that's work. For me, as a producer and a director, the work is contracts, negotiations. Um, people don't take me seriously because I'm a woman. Um, older people think that I can't be whatever, know as much as I do. Um, that can be really hard. Um, that feels like work. But other than that, it's fine. So what do you do? when it feels like work? I just keep going. You keep going. And what drives you? Well, it has to get done. If you want to be successful in a show, and I've had this happen when I was a little greener, um, producing shows, and you'll say, oh I, oh, I trust you. I don't need a contract. And then you don't get paid. And now nobody gets paid. 
and that only has to happen once, and it only did happen once to me. And now I know if I say the word contract and you don't want to work with me anymore, that means I'm going to leave because it's not going to work out. It's just not. That's, that's the red flag right there. I don't have to go any further than that. So I just keep going. I mean, and sometimes it's hard. Um, I work at the Redford Theater in Detroit doing shadow cast productions, but they're really understanding, but it can still be arduous. Like, okay, when are we going to do this? Let's talk about the terms and conditions. Just get through it with love if possible. I think that is such a common pitfall for creatives. The, the creative mind, the artistic heart, is a wide open door emotionally. We want to have things feel good, and we want to have those, those business interactions feel awesome. So I, I think we tend to give concessions that we often shouldn't. What would you advise a, an emerging creative professional to begin to weave in protections for themselves? So for instance, have contracts in place even with your friends. Shoot, I've been doing this uh, music industry thing for 25 years, and I had a situation go south just this past year with somebody that I had a personal connection with, no contract, and I thought, you know, you know what, there I go again. You think I would learn by now. So if somebody's just starting out, what would you tell them? You're worth it. And if you're not trying to get that protection somewhere in you, you, maybe you don't think you're worth it, you don't want to rock the boat, that's a problem because that undercuts all artists. People don't take us seriously then. I want to be taken seriously. I want to get paid because the work that I do is valuable. If I'm bringing in 1,500 people to a show, yeah, you're going to pay me for that. And if you don't think that's worth something, then I guess I'll just find another place. But I think it's self-worth is where it starts. I did not tell her to say that. <laughs> so my catchphrase since day one of Conversation Piece has been know your worth. I did not know that. <laughs> I truly believe that so much of the problems that creatives and creative entrepreneurs in particular experience come from worth. I, I think really that's a cultural thing, knowing your worth. Like that's the roots of the tree, not the trunk, but the roots of the tree. Oh, yeah. So when you're sitting in front of yourself at the beginning of, of your career, what do you see in that young person that is compromising their worth and how do you help them through it? Just an idea that I wanted to get out there so badly and do things that it really didn't matter at what cost myself, my schedule, people I couldn't be with because of those things. So I, I don't know. I don't know that I'd tell my younger self anything because usually you have to learn by doing. That's how I learn anyhow. Um, so it's fine. I, I mean, I got burned a couple times on some minor things and that's really all it took <laughs> to learn that that's not the way. I mean. For me, any time that I'm creating, directing, it's time I'm not home with my daughter, um, and you're gonna pay me for that. That's how I feel about it. Um, and sometimes payment does not come in money, by the way. I, get, I, I will get paid in experiences that I feel are valuable, but that's up to you. Only you know what that means to you. So value is something that kept coming up in our group discussion, and I don't want to oversimplify it, but when we talk about work, especially the, the work of creatives, it seems it comes down to simply exchanging value. The value of, of providing somebody with an experience they walk away with, feeling like they have gained something of value and you have invested value. So it's not just, I'm trading an hour of my life for a dollar amount. It's creating a commonly agreed upon exchange rate for what I value and what you value, and then giving that to each other. Is that fair? I think so. Where do you see that show up in the people that, that, that you work with? Do you, do you see them misunderstanding value? Do you, do you see them under, undervaluing their work? And do you find yourself as a leader in those organizations leading people into their worth? I try. Um, so I guess where that, like I do the zombie walk, nobody gets paid. Everything goes back into Flint. I don't get paid. I say nothing. Nobody sees anything. <laughs> so that's, I'm just gonna leave that to the side. When it comes to like 
money. Um, the directing that I do pays me, it pays my cast, who are like, we're just happy to be here. And I'm like, no, that's not enough. You're working so hard for me and for this audience. Uh, you're gonna get paid. I had somebody that I just, we just finished Princess Bride, and they, they said, I didn't know we were getting paid for this. Yeah, you just spent four months of your life on this. You are worth that. Those people were cheering for you. You're worth that. Um, and I hope that next time that person will maybe first ask, are we getting paid for this? Instead of saying, I didn't know we were getting paid for this. Compensation yeah. is a way of getting value for an investment. So what are some other ways that you see people in creative communities be compensated other than money? Audience enjoyment, because I'm in performing arts. Um, so how the audience responds to what I do, that tells me in the moment. Uh, I like to do things, I mean, in my personal life, like in my modeling, that are a little heavier and darker and more horror related. But when it comes to being on stage, I like to do things that are funny. And to listen to people forget all of their problems and guffaw. I know that they are with me and we're in this magical place right now where nothing is bothering us. That's how I judge the enjoyment of other people. Um, and, and I do hear frequently people say, I, I see you doing more and I wanna do more. Or it almost gives them permission mm. to just do what they want. And I get a great deal of satisfaction knowing that me just existing normally. I'm not forcing it. That's just how I am. That gives other people permission to be who they are. That's awesome. Because I wasn't always like this. When did you see that start to activate in your career? That is the, the modeling of being released into who you are, showing up as ripples in other people that you're leading. Well, um, in my early 20s, I was in a really, really bad um, emotional abusive marriage. And I did not do anything but sit on the couch and worry. And once I got out of that, and once I started to go, wow, I just wasted six years. <laughs> Let's catch up. Um, the more I started to just keep going and keep going, so probably now about 10 years ago, when I got with my now husband, who's very supportive, um, that's when I started noticing people say, ooh, I want to do some fun stuff. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. I think so often, just being ourselves openly is one of the most powerful things that we can give to those in our creative communities. And it's so simple. It, it sounds cliche. I use the term. It, sound, it sounds Oprah. It sounds like something you would read in an Eckhart Tolle book. Just be yourself and everything will be okay. It dissolves the ego. Just sit with yourself and everyone around you will be transformed by the nature of you being yourself. But it's really true. And you've, you've seen that in, in your circles, yeah? Yeah. So, when you're in that sweet spot, when you have something that is of you and you are leading people around you along that path so that you're modeling things that you're seeing show up in them and maybe the organization isn't at a place where you're getting the monetary compensation that you would like to give, you have the connection with the audience, you have that thing and everybody is satisfied, how, how do you get rid of the branches that want to crop up and say, you're doing this for the exposure. That, like that, that word I see pop up in creative circles all the time. Well, they want me to do it for the exposure. Because I think there is a difference between being taken advantage of, being exploited as an artist, and actually having a true purpose behind what you're doing, even when the monetary compensation might not be scale. I tend to not care how anyone else might see it at all. Uh, so if I, like for example, I volunteer interpret at a lot of places that are meaningful to me. And I really, I mean, because it, value, it benefits me or I'm learning something or I'm doing something I want. I mean, exposure, it's whatever, yeah, I think, I think sometimes that is something that artists fall into, but I don't, it's hard, I just don't care. Like, if it feels right, I'll do it. And if I'm like, yeah, because at the end, that's gonna happen, then I'll do it. I don't know. I, I just have huh? seen in, in my own path as a creative and in so many people who I coach, the worth issue 
when it's not fully realized, when they still have lingering self-worth issues, the creative will be taken advantage of and they'll do things out of obligation, uh, they'll be exploited because th they'll sit there and say, well, I would, I would do this for free anyway, so it's okay that I do it for free and I don't get paid because I'm really not that experienced or that skilled and I guess I'm not that unique or powerful and I'm just like, oh my gosh, yeah. wake up to yourself and start valuing your time and creating terms around that externally. Yeah. How, how do you see people transition from that place of taking advantage of, doing it for the exposure because they have worth issues, and being fully activated into a healthy, functioning, creative professional? Sometimes I don't. Mm. Sometimes I do. Not often, not as often do I. <laughs> um, I don't know, usually if you spend enough time with me, like I'll have people ask me to do things and I'll go, well, what are they paying? And they'll go, oh, they're not. And I'll go, oh, okay, never mind, I can't do it. And sometimes that sparks in them, oh. And a lot of times, like if it's a friend, I'll try to explain myself, like, because here's the thing, like, I'm not gonna be blind to my own skill set because it's not pompous to know that you have a skill. Like, I just realize I have a skill and hopefully, you all do realize you have a skill. And that doesn't make me big headed because I don't think I'm better than anybody else, but I have a skill. If you're asking me to do something, it's because you see that. So if you see that and I see that, I don't know what the problem is. You should be paying me, otherwise you're taking advantage. That's how I take it, I don't know. I do see it happen in people where they're like, oh, I, I am owed something for this and that's beautiful. I'm at the point where in my career, I'm ready to just charge people for hanging out with me. Do you, okay, like real talk, do you have those friends, creatives, who wink, wink, let's go out for coffee, let's go get some drinks, and then you sit down with them and it, it's suddenly a business meeting. You're giving them advice, you're giving them consultation on, on what their next project is gonna be, and I just am, am over those traps. How do you help people avoid those traps? How do you avoid those traps? That little, that's the sign for it, just that feeling in there that tells you, uh, that's not right, I listen to that. I don't ignore that. But usually people are really straightforward. Um, I wanna start a zombie walk, can you give me some advice? I don't mind. I don't mind giving you, bloop, bloop, do this, don't do this. This is what I do that works. Um, a lot of people are like, I wanna learn sign language. I'm like, cool, um, do these things and get back with me, they don't. So you just cut it off right there, you know? Uh, I, I, I personally don't mind giving advice. I don't have a lot of people that, that come to me for that. I have a lot of people who wanna be involved in what I do. Mm. That's more what I struggle with, but they don't want to. They wanna be on stage, they don't wanna do the work, and I can tell it right quick. Um, if you've never, like I have rules, like you wanna be in my shows, uh, come to a show. You haven't come to a show, you don't wanna be in them. Like that's the first step. Right, so like I just set up these rules for myself and they're like litmus tests, you know what I mean? And uh, if you can't do that, then, and I have no problem with that. <laughs> I love that. I have set that up for myself as well as a consultant. If you want my advice, I'll do the, you know, the one text question here, the one text question there, but if you actually want to sit down with me and pick my brain on something, I say, well, here's, a couple dozen hours of lecture and video that I need you to go watch. Oh, I understand that you couldn't show up to the last 20 talks I gave, but go watch these and then get back to me when you've, when you've absorbed this thought capital and you'll be able to ask me even more focused questions. I can't tell you how many times people don't do that. So how do you weed out the people who just aren't willing to do the work and the people who aren't used to doing the work, but maybe just need to be guided in the right direction. Setting up those boundaries right away, like you have to come to a show, you know. Um, that cuts out most, most everything right there. We're just right done. You can tell them people, if people haven't been around, you know, they're probably not gonna do the work. I actually usually don't hire people that I'm not friends with because I've been left, you know, left uh, on read for far too long and I'm like, eh, 
I'm, I'm used to that. And you, I don't know. I just feel like after a time, you're just like, uh, I can see it. You want the end result. Uh, I need you to want everything in between because that's mm. hard stuff. And you're, you might not like me for some of it. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's just setting up the boundaries right from the beginning. Like, here are my expectations. Clearly communicating terms and expectations in all of your partnerships. Yeah. So, I want to talk about the work itself. When you invest in something that you really care about, and we've talked about this in meetings leading up to this, it's, it's naive to think that everybody is just going to line up to buy it. And we were talking about this in our group earlier. You, you, you can't open a high-end boutique in an area with 42% poverty rate and expect it to succeed anyway. So you can't just dream up the show that you want to do and expect it to sell in any market you, you take it to. So how do, you, how do you finesse between what you're passionate about and what will succeed in front of an audience? Um, sometimes I don't know. Uh, when I started the Zombie Walk 10 years ago, I didn't know. I didn't think I'd be doing it even two years later. Um, so sometimes I'm surprised, like genuinely. And sometimes I'm like, this keeps working, damn it. I have to keep doing this. <laughs> it's, heavy, it's a heavy burden, I'm not gonna lie. It's been a decade of nonstop planning. But sometimes, like with my shadow cast, um, I have a 1,500 seat theater to fill for three shows. What do you want to see? And what do I want to do? What do I love? What do you love? How do we make it work? So that's, that's where we come from. And usually when it comes to pop culture stuff, like The Princess Bride and Labyrinth, which we did last year, Hocus Pocus, which is our next show, we kind of all love all those things. So it's not really too hard to, it's like, yeah, let's, that's everyone's favorite. Like, I would love to do my little horror movies that I love that nobody knows about but I get that I also want to get paid. Like, so the theater is also not going to go for it because they're smart. So it's a dance with the audience and, and the nature of this work. It's not terribly difficult to find your, your sweet spot. It can be. Um, like when I did, I do burlesque. I did burlesque for a long time in Flint. That was harder because no venue in Flint wanted it because they heard the word burlesque and got a picture in their mind. And I couldn't compete with that picture. And that's okay. I'm not going to keep trying to make something work that isn't working. That's not my style. I'll move on. How do you know when to jump ship? When I don't want to do it anymore. And I feel it inside that I'm weary, I'm tired, I can't keep going. That was the burlesque. It was fun and I enjoyed it. But if, if I'm not getting the... It just starts to wither inside. That's how I, you know feels like work. <laughs> it starts to feel like work. And I don't, I don't like to feel like I'm at work, ever. And I rarely do. I often, in the middle of a project, will work strings of 15-hour days. And it never feels like work. And I've got to, to actually pull the scruff of my own neck back and go, oh my gosh, you need to rest. And then, and then I'll like sleep in till 11 a.m. for six weeks. But I love work that doesn't feel like work. Now, as somebody who is the leader of a bunch of projects, you're your own supervisor, how do you manage your time? How do you manage your emotions as somebody who doesn't necessarily answer to anybody but yourself? I have always been super good at time management, so that's just an, an innate build inside of me, and I know a lot of creatives are not super good at time management. That is probably my most frustrating thing. Because if you're late for a meeting with me or for a rehearsal, I will get upset with you because you are not respecting my time that I have carved out for you. That I struggle with. <laughs> I, sometimes I get too upset. Like, why don't you respect me? <laughs> but other than that, um, lost my train of thought. Um, feed me. How do you manage your time and emotions as the leader of these organizations that are creative-based but you're not necessarily answering to anybody but yourself. So I answer the time thing. I'm just kind of good at time. Um, so I don't know if I have any tips for that because that's just innate within me because my mom is super, like, super good with time, so she taught me time really well. Um, emotions are harder. I'm an empath. I feel everything. If I'm at a rehearsal and I think you're not enjoying yourself, I'll go home and I'll be like, oh, God, what am I doing? What did I say? 
And I have to, that's really hard for me because you have to manage all these personalities. What I do is talk to my husband, who everybody likes. And I'll be like, This is true. Yeah, I'll be like, Dan, am I doing something wrong? What am I doing? And he'll be like, You're worrying too much. Everything's fine. Everybody, it's fine. Everybody's happy. Or I'll be like, I don't think anybody wants to do these things with me anymore. And he'll be like, No, 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 that's just that voice. And that voice is lying to you, and it's okay. That's how I manage the emotion, is I talk to him. Because I know he's not. And I talk to my mom a lot, too. Um, that helps. So emotional intelligence is important to you as the leader of a creative organization. It's got to be, because I see so many people without it. And it hurts projects. Things die. Because the people in charge, they don't care about the emotions. I've seen directors who are so mean and gruff. And I don't want to work for them, because now it's work. Now it's work, and now I have anxiety, and I don't want to be there anymore, and I don't want to be yelled at. I, I will never bring whatever happened to me before I came to rehearsal, I will never bring that inside. I will never come to the zombie walk angry, no matter what happened when I woke up that morning, because that's not fair. And I believe in that. Talk about some of the ways that you help to protect the boundaries of the people who are working for you, and how you help encourage their emotional intelligence as members of your organizations. I think just vigilance and looking around, paying attention. How, are, how is everybody reacting? Um, I try to hire people who do get along. I don't like to. I've had that problem where we had, we had somebody who was very toxic. And it went on for so long because it was so hard to get rid of the person that at the end almost everybody wanted to just quit because of one person. So then I learned, you have to hire the right people. You have to get really good at reading people, um, which is what happened. And sometimes you still don't know the intentions of everybody, but you just try your best. And just make it, I make it really clear, like, this is what we accept and this is what we don't, and if I'm asking you to do it, I'm going to do it too. I'm not going to ever ask anybody to do something that I am not also willing to do. So you come across as such an authority, like, you, you reek of, of, of power, personally, in, in your online branding. Where do you source from? You said that you go to your mom, you go to your husband, as, as emotional sounding boards, but where do you source your knowledge from? Where do you source um, your, your, I guess, emotional st stability from? What books do you read? What podcasts are you into? What well do you draw from? I don't feel powerful. Can I just address that? I feel like a kid who's always playing dress up. That's all. And if you think that's powerful, then that's great. That's on you. That's how I view it. Um, just because I lead things just means I'm doing what I want. I'm having a good time. Uh, for me, I just have these visions in my head, and if they don't come out, I will go crazy. And if you think that's powerful, that's great. Um, I don't particularly think it is. People ascribe me a lot of power that I don't really feel feel, mm. and I kind of don't like it, mm. um, because then people want to try to take advantage of me. Mm. And then I have to have people go, ooh, don't, maybe you shouldn't, because um, that person wants this, and you can't see that, but they do. And it's because I don't see myself as, as mm. what you just said. But the well I draw from, you know, I grew up without a lot of friends. I grew up, my mom was my best friend, and I never wanted to be away from her, <laughs> and I still don't. And we grew up watching movies. And that was, those were my friends. Those movies were my friends, and the books were my friends. So when I nerd out and I do shadow cast, um, I'm sorry, but everyone in The Princess Bride is my best friend, and they don't know, but they are. And I actually have met many of them, and they really are my best friends. Um, so to me, it's like coming home. To me, it's like a warm blanket. And I just want to be wrapped in that blanket. That's like my motivation as often. And when I'm like cosplaying, it's that blanket. That's all it is. And, and when you say the cast of The Princess Bride, you mean the actual movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what's yeah. up, Chris Sarandon? Yeah, Chris, what's for Chris dinner is tonight? my friend. Right. <laughs> he is my friend because I've just spent years just seeing him. Whatever. Like, it's not a, I know this man kind of thing. It's like, hey, we're friends. It's cool. Like, it feels good. Um, plus, he's really, I wouldn't be friends with anyone who wasn't cool and nice and sweet and genuine because I've met actors who aren't. And I'm like, no, thanks. I'm good. Thought you were something else. Bye-bye. Um, that's the well of it for me. Down in that well is my childhood, and I'm always reaching it, I'm always touching it. I think there is an inherent trustworthiness 
to a creative influencer who's a true believer in, in the work. You know, the, the photographer that nerds out about their favorite photographers. The musician who is absolutely obsessed with everything the Velvet Underground has ever put out. You know, when, when you discover somebody who's a nerd that has become great at marketing and leading, I just want to get in line behind them and follow them into battle. Do you think that's, that's a, a, fair, a fair statement? I feel that from people. But I think all that that's tapping into is their own geekery, nerddom, or maybe their own childhood where they loved the Princess Bride, and they're like, wow, you're, man, 32 years later, you're working with this material. What? Like you give them permission to, to nerd out and just yeah. like what they like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope that's what's happening. I don't know. I think being a nerd is kind of cool anymore, but... Uh, yeah, I hope. So talking about the, the source, the well, the place where you get fed, um, do you have any mentors or people that you look up to? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I'm not saying I don't. Um, my husband, who's very much like me, um, who is in theater, he teaches theater, and he'll just go and do what he wants. He'll be like, oh, I have this idea, let's do this. And I love that. And that's probably part of the reason I married him, because I, I knew him a long time before we started dating. And I was always drawn to that about him. Um, and I kind of took inspiration from him, honestly. But uh, probably my geek friends, too, because I go to a lot of horror movie conventions. And they are all just super nerds. And they do not care who knows. They don't care at all. It's great. Well, thinking about the cast of The Princess Bride in particular, these, these people who are idols, they're cultural icons, but they're, they're human beings that you have had the, the privilege of logging some hours with. What have you gleaned from them as, as professionals, tips that you have taken and woven into your own endeavors? They're pretty gracious, um, and it's, it's just a part of their life. It, I mean, I got the great good fortune of meeting Carrie Elwes, who's Wesley and the Princess Bride, um, like a month and a half ago or something, a couple months ago. And it's just like, yeah, this is a part of my life that took off, and I didn't know it was going to take off, and I deal with it. <laughs> That's what I got from him. Like, and he honors it. And he tells stories um, in a way that the audience wants to hear. He's catering to the audience as well, and you could tell he's really happy and just grateful. So that's, I don't know, like, like when I'm, like I'm doing the zombie walk, and sometimes I wonder how much longer I can do it for. But when I hear other people be super excited about it, I'm like, oh, that's right. That's why I'm still doing it. That's cool. And I feel like that from him, too. That is so interesting to hear you talk about Carrie Elwes saying, this is a part of my life that took off, and I didn't, I didn't know it was going to take off, but I'm kind of here for it, and I'm grateful. So what's the role of gratitude in your work? I always find that I am super grateful, like... Like, we'll talk about the zombie walk because it's happening Saturday. Um, I'm getting a lot of press right now, and the Flint Journal was like, we want to get a portrait of you, and I was on the news, and I'm like, I feel like my volunteer should be there because I couldn't do it without them. Uh, every person who comes in Flint couldn't do it without you. I feel like I, it's not this, it's this, and uh, I feel just really grateful that people care. That's all. I just... I don't know. I might be steering the ship, but I need a crew. So not to, to encourage people to think about compromising our own worth in this way, but what do you think about the statement, we're only worth as much as the people who are on our team? Absolutely. Yeah, none of, none of anything I could do. I don't really do... I mean, I model and that's solo, but even that takes a good photographer. So there's really not anything I could do if it wasn't for the people around me who helped me get it done. And I recognize that, and I am, I am so big on showing people, like, I'll bake you something, and I'll be like, come over, let me feed you, let me give you a gift. I handwrite notes to all my cast after everything, and they're sincere, and I'll take 10 minutes on each note, because I want them to know how I feel about them, and they keep coming back, so I'm hoping that means they feel loved, which is, which is the whole thing. What do you think the responsibility is of a creative influencer to the people who they're leading? Maybe, maybe you're an unintentional mentor to a lot of people. Some people look up to you the way that you look up to the cast of The Princess Bride, for instance. What, but what do you think 
our responsibility is as creative influencers to the people on our team or people who we're leading? Um, kindness. That's my, that's my big thing. Always kindness and understanding and a level head. And you have to set um, boundaries with love. So um, I love you, but don't be late. Um, but if you are, if something happened, call me, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna yell at you on the phone. Like we have a responsibility to each other. I think it starts with kindness. I love that. So you're right in the middle of busy season. Yeah. Like you're between projects. Thank yeah. you so much for for making time to be here for this event. While we have you right bullseye in the middle of all these things, what do you see is a theme in your work? Like just what's on your mind? What's on your heart? What do you want to talk about? What's knocking on your door right now? A theme. Um, gosh. I don't know what a theme is. Because I just keep doing what comes to my head. So that's the theme. Uh, whatever I'm dreaming up and making happen seems to be working. So that's the theme. Uh, keep going with that. Um, the zombie walk is coming, and that's Saturday, and the whole goal of that is the Flint water crisis. So we partnered with Boxed Water, and they are giving us a huge deal on ethically sourced water. Um, not in plastic, by the way, in cartons. And um, it's all for that. So, I mean, that's the thing that's coming up next. And I know, you know, you're all, you're all from Flint, I presume. I don't know if you've been affected by the water crisis, but um, that's really big to me. Give back. Um, that's the next thing for me. And, and I try to hibernate a little bit in the winter and just focus on my career as an interpreter. So community, the role of the creative influencer in their community. Yeah. What is our responsibility to the city, to the family that we are placed in? I don't know. Part of me thinks uh, you don't necessarily have to do what you do for anybody, and that might include the community. Maybe it is about you, and that's okay. And I would give you permission to just do something for yourself. But if you have the means to help other people, I don't think we're getting anywhere without that. We as in anybody <laughs> on the planet. So I just have started a little thing that's been going for 10 years and we've given thousands and thousands of dollars to Flint. So if we could all do just one thing, man, we could really get something done. So not just talking about the responsibility of a creative influencer to their community, but the power, the potential. Talk more about our ability to design the city that we want to live in. Well, art is a great influencer, and art is commentary. And I think, you know, in a place like Flint, there's a ton of art. So I think, I just think there's a ton of opportunity. And I've lived in Chicago, and I've lived in New York City, and it's really hard to make an impact there because everyone's doing it. It's not as hard in Flint. Um, that's why I live here, actually. I, I was born here, but... Um, I like to live somewhere where my voice can be heard and make a difference, so I choose Flint. Um, I don't want to get lost in a sea of a thousand people. I want you to hear me. So, I mean, hopefully, I think if you just keep doing your thing, it makes a difference. Someone hears it. What makes you feel heard? What are the things that let you know that you're having an impact in your community? When people show up. <laughs> Um, when I see 600 people at the zombie walk, I go, you're hearing me. Um, we're hearing each other, really. Uh, because it's everything I've ever done for that organization has been for Flint. It's, you know, I guess that's your presence. Um, if you donate, if you care, if you just even say like, oh, I can't be there, but I'm supporting you. Or like, well, here's something for the raffle. I can't be there. That's how I know. I will never forget the, you know, the email that I got saying, oh my gosh, that song that you wrote got me through a really hard time in my life. And what's interesting is it usually comes at a time in my life where I need to, I need to hear that feedback. And I think that it's, 
it's an interesting illusion that just because you're in a position of authority in your community or your profession or your, your position in, in a place of visibility as a creative influencer, that you still don't have that widely flung open door of emotional vulnerability. So we're, we're still so sensitive. And that's where our power lies. But how do you keep equanimous and, and not bow down to the criticism and the failure and, and not be overly inflated by the, by the praise. What keeps you grounded? I do feel the criticism. I feel every word of it, but I don't go looking for it. So if you don't tell me directly, I'm probably not gonna know about it. That's the first thing. Never read the comments, right? Just never. It, uh, I, I try to give people like a way to express what they're feeling or like what could be worked on constructively that I have no problem with because I need that. Um, sometimes I do. I just cry because something didn't go well. Someone was really mean to me. I'm so sensitive. <laughs> like it, it sucks being this sensitive, but I am. And I pass it on to my daughter, so lucky her. Um, but I honor it. Like I, this is just the way that I am. Mm. And like... I have to have thick skin to do public things, and not everyone's gonna like it. Uh, just last night, I posted like, I got 10 cases of water from Boxed Water. Somebody wrote a paragraph about why Boxed Water was terrible and how I should be doing better. Me, who's been working a full year on this event for Flint, that hurts my feelings. Because you never help, you never respond, you never wanna make it better, you only wanna criticize. But then I think, that's a you problem at the end of the day. I can't fix that, that's ugly. You know, or you could come to me and be like, ooh, you know, I heard this and I just wanted to let you know and I'd go, cool, cool. But you don't have to be so mean. Mm. So at the end of the day, I just, that's not my problem. I go to my family for support, that's the other thing. Mm. I don't feel like I have a big head at all. Um, I'm constantly criticizing myself. I am my own worst enemy. Mm. All interpreters are. When I lay in bed at night, I'm just like, okay, what did you mess up? What, did, what could you have done better? I'll tell you, when I'm on stage, like I leave and I'm like, oh, five things you messed up. That's five things you need to do better next time. It was never the things I got right, not ever. Mm. I think artists often feel that way. <laughs> how do you keep that from compromising your worth? How do, you, how do you keep it so that the voice can speak to you but not inform your identity? Well, I recognize it for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's huge. Like, I don't mean to cut you off, but just observing it and calling it for what it is. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I think it is. It, it, it's how I get better. And if I'm feeling really bad about things, I will tell somebody. And that's the other thing. Somebody I trust will be like, was it that bad? Or what is it really? And a lot of times it's just knowing, um, when I went through interpreter training, we learned about this thing called the committee for a long time. And it's that, that committee that lives in your head that tells you all the bad things. And we actually learned about ways to dismantle the committee and to have it sit down so you can do your job. That has helped me in every area of my life. It's just the committee. That's just, every, I also learned this thing that might help you. The first thought you think is usually what you've been programmed to think. The second thought is who you are. And so I'm like, okay, that's my first thought. What's my second thought? The second thought is usually like, that's okay, you can do better tomorrow. It's not a big deal, go to bed. I love that. So we're gonna close out and transition into Q&A. But just real quick, what are you excited about next for Flint? For, for your role as a creative influencer in, in Flynn, what are you looking forward to? Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do next. I usually never do. Um, I just love to see Flint growing. I love to see all the businesses. This is amazing, this whole place right here. I'm just excited to see it grow. I actually think, I, you know, I know the pipes are being replaced and it's gonna take a while, but there are so many cities with bad pipes and we're like the first to get new good ones. And I actually see that possibly being a boon to Flynn because we're gonna be like, yeah, we got the new pipes. Like, why wouldn't you wanna come here? So I'm hoping that does some good. I love that you said that because at the first conversation piece, I articulated as one of the reasons that we gather is to encourage people in the creative community and beyond, not just to problem solve. We don't just wanna fix the pipes. 
we don't just want adequate water. We want awesome water. So we're not in the business of filling up holes. We're in the business of building sandcastles. Like, we can pole vault from tragedy to inspiration. That's what I'm excited about, too. Yeah. So questions for Christina or myself. We've got a microphone right over here. Just go ahead and come on up. Oh, last call on coffee. If you, want something, come get it. if you guys want something, go see Cam. He'll hook you up. Anybody want to say something? Offer a comment on what we talked about tonight or what we addressed in groups earlier? Phil. Yeah, I mean. Oh. Oh. There we go. All right. Cool. Um, Phil Walker. Phil Walker. Um, you covered, like, the interview was very thorough because you covered a lot of questions that I want to ask as far as how do you leverage exposure versus, um, what was it, quality in quality versus money. You know what I'm saying? So um, thank you, Ashley. And I'm sorry, your name again. Christina. Christina. Cool. So I enjoyed that, and I'm sorry for coming in late as well. But um, yes, that's what I want to say. Thanks oh, for no. coming. Thank you so much, Phil. Phil Walker from Phased. Catch him in Mixed Down at Factory 2, October 12th. I'm going to be in L.A., man. I'm so sorry I'm going to miss that. You guys are going to kill it. It's a, it's a really great event. Other comments, questions? Hey, Devin. So, Christina, um, maybe you did touch on this a little bit, but what was the catalyst that really caused you to change? Change what? From being stuck on the couch mm -hmm. with an abusive husband to, mm -hmm. hey, check this out. Things are pretty awesome right now. Mm. Uh, I had a newborn at the time. Mm. That'll make you change real quick when you become a single mom and you realize that everything can be taken from you really fast. Um, that was when I was like, wow, I've been wasting my life. Get going. That's all it took for me. You realize a lot of things when something traumatic happens to you. So, you know, better late than never. So you take the J.K. Rowling approach. <laughs> yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, I hope people don't have to learn that way, but I think oftentimes they do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. I love what you said about leveraging failure. You take the challenges that come your way and you just learn from them. We talked about that several times in conversation piece, subsequent or uh, previous previous events. It's it's not about avoiding failure in the life of a creative. It's not about looking for perfection. It's about being real with yourself and saying, "Hey, you know what? You could have done better, but there's there's always there's always tomorrow." I don't think I would have learned half of what I learned had I not failed. And I think, again, that's a skill of an interpreter. You do something wrong, um, and you're not doing it again. You're just not. That's the only way you're going to get better at it. And I'm okay with failure. I think people want to run from that. I don't know how else you learn. Like, I don't, I don't learn the best when everything's going great, personally. Mark. So I, don't, I don't have any questions, but some takeaways. I, I'm, I'm really, we live in different worlds. What, what you do doesn't interest me at all. But what's amazing is how much we have in common. Hmm. So, uh, one of the, so one of the takes, takeaways I have here is that we have the ability to create the community, the Flint, that we want. We have an unusual, uh, unusual opportunity. And, and um, and I'm glad you're here doing what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. So the second takeaway is I heard you say over and over again that we need to value one another. Um, when I was a kid, it was said from, from church, is where I probably first heard, no, I've heard it from my grandmother, treat one another like you want to be treated. Okay. And, and that, it, 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 it seems like this, we were talking about this at the table, it seems like we, money has caused us to separate from building relationships. And, 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 we for, and, and we just think about what we want for ourselves. You know, right now, you know, it's a me first generation, and I see that all the time. I think we have to, as we're building ourselves and creating a better mark, 
I need to think about how I relate to you and how I value you and, and how, how I treat you and that, it, that I'm treating you at least as like I want to be treated. And um, the third thing I heard you say that I have, and I'm not sure how it came up, but you talked about it, it sometimes it's hard. And, and I heard you say there's, you know, you don't get up until 11 o'clock because of something that didn't go the way you want to. You're, you're, you know, you're, and, and, and I have that same issue. And one of the things that I've, I make myself do is every morning I get up and I think about the things that I did the day before, or maybe, maybe I have to think back further, that, that I've accomplished. Because for me, it's never enough. It's, it's it, you know, I, no matter how well I do, it, it's, I'm falling short of what I could do. And, and so, anyway, that's my takeaways. I really appreciate it tonight. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I love that. Inadequacy versus not being enough. So if I, if I may, I'll take that and voice it the way I heard it. So keeping that constant hunger, that pursuit of greatness in your craft or, or improving on your methods versus inadequacy, beating yourself up, compromising your worth, identifying with just not ever being good enough. How do you tell the difference and how do you apply that into your own, your own endeavors? I don't know. I think sometimes you don't. It's never enough for me either. And it was never good enough for me either. Um, I don't know that I have a great answer for that, except for I've been doing it so long that I love it so much that if I, I would rather be dead than stop. And so if I don't, if I don't keep going, I might as well die. So, like, it's what? Keep going or die. So I'll keep going. And it's, I'll get better at it. It's funny that you mention that. And I coach people on stage fright by talking about death. <laughs> so for me, stage fright, crippling stage fright, has been something that's haunted me since day one. The fear of rejection, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of letting people down publicly was, was paralyzing. And it, it got to a point where I knew that I was supposed to be on stage, regardless of how I felt before I walked onto it. So I just kept doing it. And I got to do it enough times that it was a game of odds. It's, well, you know, I haven't actually died all these times that I've been on stage, so what are the odds that something bad's going to happen this next time? But I actually, in, in recent years, took it to that place of, what is rejection? What is failure? They're just echoes. They're ripples of death. And I think about what is the worst case scenario? What is the worst thing that can happen to me? And I mentally put myself there. I live through it. And I observe sometimes the physiological responses of, of anxiety and paralysis. And I thought, okay, well, that's, that's over with. Now I can be real on stage. Yeah, and uh, the other thing that might help um, is whenever I have an audience, I am aware that they are there for a good time. They've primed themselves to have a good time. So they're ready for me to succeed. Unless there's a critic writing a review who might actually be critical, they're like, we're here to have a good time. We're here to learn something tonight. So you're going to take something away because that's what you wanted to begin with. I love that mindset because you're assuming a positive thing about their energy rather than a negative. They're there already walking through the door. Allies, yeah. not enemies. They, they paid money. They want to have a good time. They don't want to leave disappointed. That's fantastic. Yeah. Good. Hope it helps. Other questions? I David. Have, I have one. Um, I am interested on in how somebody can get involved in some of your community projects. If you can kind of give us some feedback. I've been here through the night in the conversations and there's lots of stuff going on and I'm just kind of, for the audience that isn't here and myself, how could I get some more information and get involved with more of your projects? It's a great question. Uh, well, the zombie walk is Saturday from 11 to 4 at the Flint Local and you can just come. You could just come. Just show up. You just show up. You can always volunteer for me, but I will vet you um, because I have had people not show up and then I'm like, ah, what do I do? Um, 
that's all. If you want to come to a show, come to a show. And if you want to be in a show, come to a show, and then tell me you want to be in the show, and then come to the next show. We'll see what happens. <laughs> that's all. Um, so Facebook, social media, Flint Zombie Walk, Goblin King Players. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. So now I actually have a question. Um, so talking about creative energy, this could be for both of you guys, right? You say how you, you know, have a season where you're ramping up the zombie walk. And then after that, you kind of go into this low period where you focus on your other job as in um, interpreting. Can you talk about like, uh, like your creative energies and what is the switch? What is, what is it that, that, okay, it's time to start, you know, getting it into, into gear? Because sometimes... Um, because I, I do the switch every day, you know, work nine to five and then come back five to four o'clock in the morning and then do it over. So flipping that switch, what is it that like, you know, it's time for me to start getting, getting it going? Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, since I'm a horror gal, uh, I'm really busy in September and October with horror things. And I tend to slide into fall exhausted, like skid into it, and I'm like, okay, I'm done. I can't do anymore. So that's that part of it. That's really easy to know. I tend to get seasonal depression, as I'm thinking a lot of people in Michigan do. So that's my uh, time. Uh. When it gets warm again, and we start having conventions and things start happening, I don't, I don't do shows in winter because uh, we have found that we have to cancel more rehearsals and we just can't do the shows. We can't give them what they need. So that's like... The, the pattern of weather in Michigan sets my creative time. When it starts to get warm, I go, Ooh, I feel it. I feel it coming, all these projects from like March to October. So that's how it works for me. I wanna leapfrog off of what you just said. And I think emotional intelligence is huge. You have to know how you're wired. You, you have to acquaint yourself with your own brain, with your own emotional palette. And you know what colors dry up on you before the other ones do. And you have to understand that that's gonna affect the thing that you're painting. So if you are prone to seasonal depression, know that about yourself before it happens to you so that you can prepare for it. And that's, that's a longer arc of things. And maybe within a 24 hour period, you see something similar. Maybe you're affected by food a certain way and you know that you're not gonna be as productive after eating as you are before. Things like that. You just have to know yourself on the small, and on a large scale, so that you can begin to develop rhythms that, one, honor yourself, but also encourage growth. Because you can say, well, this is just how I am, and I'm going to set up a world to maintain how I am. And you might be enabling some, some things that are actually unhealthy. Maybe you need medication. Maybe, there, maybe there's, there's um, some therapy that can help you get into better and better and better rhythms. But you have to start that just by knowing yourself. Something that was huge for me was understanding the role of rest and work in creating things. So I think that typically in our culture, we see that we rest from our work. We work ourselves to the bone and then we rest because we need to. We're exhausted. We're depleted. So we kind of start maybe at this baseline. Right, And then we work ourselves below the baseline. We're absolutely exhausted, we're zombies. And then we rest to bring ourselves maybe back up to a place of kind of normal, normal functionality. I think that is depriving us of a healthy life and depriving the world of our best work. So what if we did the opposite? What if we rested before we worked? What if I... What if I knew that sleeping in until 11 a.m. every day for six weeks was about preparing for a project instead of recuperating from one? It would mean I have to get rid of the guilt. The guilt that still haunts me just because I want to take a nap. But for me, I understand that rest has to be preemptive, premeditated, <laughs> planned, and protected. I just came up with that. I should patent it. Yeah, I should do a TED talk. Okay, so so for me, 
And I suspect for a lot of creatives, rest is a lot further down the list than it should be. And I, I think it should, it should come first. I used to have insomnia. Now I sleep like a baby. What does that phrase come from? Anyway, babies don't really sleep that no, long. No. <laughs> but I, I learned tools to help myself prioritize, protect sleep. And apart from that, I meditate, I nap. Rest is really important to me. I'll let myself sleep in for six weeks if I need to, just to care for myself so that I can prepare to be useful to my craft and to the people that I care about. And it all starts with, with knowing yourself and dissolving the constructs and expectations that you put on yourself because we live in a society that values productivity at all costs. Is that helpful? Okay. Sammy. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing well, Sam. Thanks. Glad you're here, man. Um, basically, I had a question. Like, um, right now, I'm starting some, a whole bunch of projects right now. Like, my school asked me to design um, a mentor program for them. Another department wants me to design one for them. Like, okay, that's cool. I got all these other things going on. So um, basically, when you're building up like a program or anything, like your new projects, um, how would you go about expanding, putting people on that team? Uh, people you trust, people you know will respect you, and people you know are timely, because it sounds like you gotta be really timely with that kind of thing. That's where I always start. Um, Man, I, you might have to, do you have to interview people, you think? Um, some of them. Some of them? Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I, I mean, hopefully you can look at that interview and ask them the right questions and mm -hmm. kind of gather how serious that they are. But also, if they're not and it doesn't work out, have no guilt about letting them go. Mm -hmm. Because that's important for both of you. If it's not working out for you, it's probably not working out for them either. That is an extremely useful answer, so I'm going to give you one that might not be useful. Hire yourself first. I know that's not what you were looking for. Hire yourself first, especially when you're doing something, maybe because someone asked you to. Mm -hmm. So we need you to do this thing. Make sure that you're not a warm body. Make sure that if you're going to lead something, you have purpose, that you are uniquely placed in that position that you would hire yourself. Because if you're not sold on yourself, it's gonna compromise every subsequent partnership. I just wanna build off a little bit on the subject of rest that you, just simply that you just brought up. So I've been doing a couple of experiments for the past six months, and it all started when, now, I have for years been the cycle of go 150% five days a week and then just totally shut down the entire weekend and then hopefully be rested enough to tackle the week once it came. Started mixing things up a little bit once I realized like, you know, this isn't healthy. This is gonna start giving me wrinkles well before my time. The first experiment was I vowed to not leave my home until I was ready for a week. There were pretty much every day that week, I didn't leave for work until three o'clock in the afternoon. Over time, I've achieved more balance. And now I can get up actually before 10 without even trying. And there's been other things I've incorporated. So do you guys have any idea how much sugar we consume in a day? The World Health Organization recommends 30 grams of sugar. A taro milk bubble tea contains, I think, 60 grams. Um, a, a regular Coke, uh, about 52, just to kind of give you some ideas there. That was, this is my current experiment, cutting out sugar. Affects my sleep, and I found that I am not only more productive, but I'm just far happier, far more, I'm, I'm prior, this is the key thing, I'm prioritizing things better. Mm. I actually have mind power to prioritize. So if you struggle with prioritizing what the heck it is you're supposed to do, you know, maybe sleep is where it's at. You know, maybe you just need to make more mental energy for yourself in whatever way you need to do that. That's, yeah. 
That's yes. about it. That's great, Devin. Thanks for the input. Know thyself. Work. And then in. So, uh, so I'm just going to tell you what I do for myself because it seems like we all have a similar issue here. But, but meditation, and, and I meditate different, I, I just empty everything out and I, and I wait for answers to come. You know, if I, if I got to say, you know, I'm like the one gentleman here, I've got 100 projects going on at once, you know, and, and the weather, you know, I'm an urban farmer, so the weather changes what I do. Um, it sets, so I'll just sit in quiet, and I'll just concentrate and relaxing everything, clearing everything out of my head. Sometimes I'll do a little mantra. I have, um, I have a little, little thing that I say over and over again, so it's, and then all of a sudden things just fall in place. And I have a number of friends who are very successful, and they spend up to three hours a day in some type of meditation. Wow. So, and, and, and they're high, highly productive people. And so, that's anyway, great. That's that is so interesting. It reminds me of um, Martin Luther, who said, he said a lot. <laughs> um, he said, if I don't pray for three hours a day, I don't have time to get anything else done. And, you know, I, I exchange the word pray for whatever it is that centers you. So meditation, if I don't meditate for three hours a day, I don't have time to get anything else done. But just because of the, for me, the focus that it gives me. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll do two meditations a day, but sometimes I'll introduce a midday meditation, which may or may not turn into a nap. <laughs> but that, I find that when I take more time out of my schedule to to, to, do, to do something that people might think is unproductive, the rest of my day is so much more productive. I'm just more efficient, more focused. Dan, I'll let you close this out. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, before I bootstrapped my company, I dedicated myself to 30 to an hour and a half nap every day, and I've never broken that. <laughs> so I'm down with the sleep thing. Uh, you're privy to this already. I'm always in business development kind of mode, and we've been talking a lot about a lot of creativity and theory, which I love because I don't exist there all the time. And you talked about early on giving of yourself in some kind of free capacity, maybe getting burnt, learning contracts. And it popped in my head. I've personally never thought of this before, and I want, to ta I want you guys' take on it. Um, contracting for free work. I don't know why it's never popped in my head, and I'm so far past that stage that I don't think about it all the time. But what is your take on I'm willing to give my value and not get money, but these are the terms, and we're going to stick to this and protect yourself that way. Yeah, I do that. Um, usually I just do it via email, like with very clear, like I don't need to like draft something official um, where like the undersigned person means, you know, all these legal terms. I'm just like, here's what I expect, one, two, three. And uh, if the person goes, that's great, then that to me is enough. But clear expectations, is may that's maybe your point, like clear expectations, like what I'm going to do and then what I'm going to get from you. Yeah, yeah, because I've been in a lot of performance situations where... Um, I've actually had no dressing room or they've been like, it's outside, it's in the mud. Like, no, literally, that happened to me. It's um, in the chip closet. That happened to me too. Mm-mm, nope, nope, that's not valuing me. So yes, that's very important. That is a fantastic perspective. And yes, absolutely. I think contract for free work, I've, I've done it many times in many different ways. My only caveat would be, where are the teeth coming from? So in what ways is this dynamic enforceable for either one of us? Tr traditionally, oh, you contract for money, well, you're in breach of contract, you don't get the money. It's very simple. But if, if we have a, a formalized understanding that doesn't involve money, where are the teeth in the contract? So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here tonight for another conversation piece. The next event is November 1st. We will have James Thigpen Jr., who is a marketing guru, brand builder. I love this dude's mind. Please come and join us for that. It's going to be November 1st, Thursday, from 6 to 8 p.m. in this very room. I want to especially thank, speaking of this room, the first, first wheel building, 100K Ideas. They are our primary sponsor this evening. They have been so supportive of what we do. And if you are a creative that has an idea that you think needs to go to market, go see them. Their counter is right over there. You could come in tomorrow, get a coffee from Foster's, and then come see 100K Ideas, and they can have a conversation with you about making 
your vision is something that's real. Thank you so much, Christina, for being here tonight. Thanks I hope the zombie walk goes awesome for you. Me too. See you November 1st, guys. <laughs>